Hi, Andrew. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. These are very interesting times in the study of human resilience. We are experiencing a, a transformative moment, a moment when what it means to be human, how our minds, how our morals, how our vices and virtues operate, is being reexamined and redefined. The big question is, are we ruled by self-interest alone, or can we come together for greater purposes? To find the answer, we're going to have to be integrative. And that means we're also standing in a moment when science and religion are meeting on the same playing field, causing each to confront long-held views. And to my mind, nowhere is this synergy more apparent than in the study of compassion. You see, there's a great debate going on about whether compassion is necessary for humans to flourish. Is it encoded in our nature? Do we need it to survive and be resilient, both as individuals and as society? Many spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama believe that's the case. But is it true? It's a good question, because as we all know, human nature can be brutish. We're capable of great acts of atrocity, of greed, of selfishness, as evidenced on a grand scale by people like Joseph Kony, but as evidenced on a much more minor scale by many of us in the infractions we commit every day by just choosing to ignore other people in need. Of course, as a species, we're also capable of great acts of love, great acts of kindness and generosity, sometimes even surprising ourselves with how virtuous we can be. Now, as scientists, we've tended to study the former. Right? We've tended to have this view that the human mind is selfish. Accumulation of resources was where the action was. Kindness, generosity, for lack of better words, were strategic facades that we would use to achieve our selfish goals. In the end, rational self-interest was going to dictate our actions. But there's a problem with this view. And the problem is acting selfishly doesn't always lead to the best outcomes. And so here again, we have spiritual leaders from many traditions arguing that compassion is the key to happiness and resilience. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, if you want society to be resilient, practice compassion, says the Dalai Lama. Now, if we look at the scientific data, there's beginning to be hints that this is true. Yes, you can, in fact, force individuals under threat in the short term to do what you want. But in the long term, it's appearing that uh, compassion and cooperation lead to better outcomes. There's great simulations by people like Martin Nowak and people like Dave Rand, who was one of our pop tech fellows um, who you heard from yesterday, that suggest that over the long haul, it is individuals and societies that don't engage in escalation of violence, individuals and societies that engage in cooperation and compassion that win. So which is it? Are we by nature selfish and brutal with only religion and philosophy to rein us in? Or is it the case that our impulses to be good, to reach out to others, are innate and only corrupted by our conscious desires to maximize our own goals? The answer is both and neither. Both in that it's a balance between selfish and selfless desires that characterize human nature. Neither in that no one of these motives is more fundamental or basic than the other. Both of them exist in the non-conscious and conscious minds. Which ones emerge in any one moment are primarily determined by what's going on in the world around us. If we can, learn, if we can learn to encourage the right ones, though, we can have a great impact on that world. And what I'd like to do today is to begin a conversation with you about how we do just that. So in the time I have left, I want to do two things. I want to give you some scientific evidence for the power of compassion. But then I want to ask what in some ways is a more interesting question, which is to borrow Thaler and Sunstein's terms, how do we nudge it? How do we increase it in society? So let me start with the first. Many religious traditions have this notion that compassion is a moral force, that it can radiate outwards causing kindness and forgiveness to other individuals, including individuals who have intentionally transgressed and didn't even ask for forgiveness. Now, it's a nice idea 
but it has no scientific backing. That's where my group comes in. The problem is, how do you study compassion? I can't go up to you and say, would you be compassionate to some hypothetical? Because one of two things will happen. People will lie to you. Or what I think is more likely, they don't really know. It's hard to know what you will do unless you're facing it when push comes to shove. And so the way to study compassion is to study it in real time. And so in my lab, what that means we have to do is we have to stage it for people. So we, des we designed an experiment where we would have an individual uh, view other, another individual who cheats on a task to earn money. And then they're given the opportunity to punish him. Now the trick is half of the individuals are going to be made to feel compassion towards someone else first, not the guy who cheated someone else. If the Dalai Lama is right, if compassion is a moral force, then as you feel compassion toward one person, your punishment and aggression toward others should go down, even though they're not seeking your forgiveness. So here's the way the experiment worked. There were three individuals in each session. Two of them worked for us. Only one was a real participant. The cheater was the uh, person who sometimes cheated, sometimes didn't. The inducer is the person who sometimes evokes compassion and sometimes doesn't. And the third person is the real participant. And the way the study works, to make a long story short, as we tell subjects, you're going to solve math problems for money. The more you solve, the more you're going to get paid. But in some conditions, the guy playing the role of cheater cheats in full view of the other subjects in such a way that he earns much more money than they ever could. Um, where does compassion come in? Well, compassion comes in in the following, following way. And sometimes when the guy cheats, this other woman begins to sniffle up and tear up. We actually gave her saline drops for her eyes. But she was a great actress. And she would start to tell the experimenter, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time. It's just that I, I, I'm worried about my brother. I, I found out recently that you know, he has a terminal illness. And to this day, even though I know the whole video is a setup, she's such a great actress, I can't watch it because it still pulls at my heartstrings. And it reliably made our subjects feel compassion for her. And then what happened is we took the subjects and put them into the last part of the experiment, which we told them is a taste perception study. Really what the taste perception study is, is a measure of aggression. Because we told them, you have to prepare taste samples for the other subjects. Here's a little cup. Um, we're, we're sampling spicy taste. And so we gave them a bottle of this real evil looking hot sauce. You know, the kind that has the crazy warnings about don't, don't use this very much, it will kill you. Um, and they had to pour hot sauce into this cup. And whatever they poured in there, they knew would be placed in its entirety into the mouth of the other guy, the guy who sometimes cheated or didn't. And so what you have here is a validated measure of aggression. The more you pour, the more pain you are intentionally inflicting on this guy. Of course, he didn't really get it, but, but they didn't know that. So, so what happens? So in the neutral condition, where this is where the guy didn't cheat. They don't want to cause them pain. They don't pour very much. They pour about two grams of hot sauce, and they have to pour something in because they know they're, they're, you know, they have to make a taste sample. When he cheats, they pour five times as much. <laughs> they load it up. They really want this guy to suffer. OK, that may not be that surprising. The interesting thing, though, is what happens when they were feeling compassion for this other woman. Punishment goes away. It is completely extinguished. If you look, there's no difference in how much they pour than in the condition where he didn't cheat. Now, they still know he cheated, and they still told us they're angry about it, and they still told us that they really want to go and tell him what he did was wrong. But the compassion they were feeling for the woman made them refuse to escalate violence and to cause any more pain. Now, the interesting thing is the implications suggest that compassion for one will cause will reduce punishment and aggression for another. And what that means is within a society, even if you can have small proportions of individuals feeling compassion, it should produce a cascade of forgiveness that serves as a break on escalations of violence and allows a society to become resilient to such escalations. Question two, OK, how do we do that? How do we increase it? So to do this, I like, I like to tell a, a quick story. Um, many of you may know the story. It's a famous event from World War I called the Christmas Eve Truce. So the, the British and the Germans were fighting in trenches outside Ypres, Belgium. And it was a long and a bloody battle. 
But on Christmas Eve, as the British were looking across the no man's land in between the trenches, they began to see lights. And then they started to hear songs. They couldn't tell what they were saying because it was German, but they could hear songs. And they soon realized by the melodies that it was Christmas carols. And what happened next, even by their own words, was amazing. The men came out of their trenches and they started celebrating together. Now, these were men who the day before were trying to kill each other. Yet here they were, exchanging trinkets, showing pictures of their family, drinking together. The reason why, I think, is because in those moments, they stopped seeing themselves as Germans and British. They saw themselves as fellow Christians. Now, we've seen this happen lots of other times. My favorite example is 9-11. Uh, Many of you will remember, right after 9-11, it, it was a contentious election when George Bush beat Al Gore. But I remember President Bush walking into the well of the house, and Tom Daschle, who was the leader of the Democrats at the time, came up to him, and he embraced him. And it was a heartfelt embrace. And in that moment, we weren't red America. We weren't blue America. We were just Americans. And the political rancor faded away, for a while at least. So the question is, how do you show such compassion one moment and such cruelty the next? To answer that question, I think we have to consider a different one first. And that is, there's many more people in the world than we, any one of us can help. How does our mind determine who is worthy of our compassion and help? And the way it does it, I think, is by using a simple metric of similarity. What this suggests is that the distress we see someone experiencing, the compassion we feel for them, isn't determined by the objective facts on the ground. It's determined by who's looking. Now, many of you will remember the tragedies associated with Hurricane Katrina. And at the time, there were many individuals who said, well, the reason help was so slow in coming was because the, the primary victims were uh, members of, uh, of a poor minority group, and therefore, statistically at least, different than the majority of Americans. If that's true, what it means is that it's not the severity or the objective facts of a disaster that motivate us to feel compassion and to help. It's whether or not we see ourselves in the victims. The question as a scientist is, OK, how do, we, how do we show this? How deeply ingrained in the mind is this? And so we wanted to strip similarity down to its most basic element. And so what we used is joint movement. Okay, joint movement is an ancient marker of individuals coming together for joint purpose. We see it in military drills. You see it in conga lines. You're all going to get to experience it tonight with Palabolas. So I really encourage you to go and be a part of it and to experience it in real time for yourself. The idea is that synchrony is a marker for separate identities to merge into a larger one. And it has no other meaning besides that. And all the subjects coming into our experiment aren't going to really be thinking about this. So the way we did the experiment is as follows. We brought people into the lab. We told them, you're doing a music perception study. We sat them down across the table from each other. They put on earphones. Their job was, as they heard the tones, to tap their hands on sensors in the table. Now, for some of the subjects, the tones were such that they would tap their hands in unison. For others, the tones were randomized so that there would be no association or linkage. After that, um, we had them watch one of the people who actually worked for us, um, who they were tapping with, get cheated by someone else, which basically meant he was stuck doing this really long and onerous task. Then we just sat back and we waited. What we wanted to see is would any of these people be motivated to feel this guy's pain and to come to us and say, hey, you know what? This isn't fair. Can I, can I help this person? He's really stuck doing this terrible thing. What we found is that the simple act of joint movement made people feel more similar to each other. Now, they couldn't tell you why. They would create all kinds of crazy stories that didn't mean anything, because their mind, their gut was telling them, I feel similar to this guy. But they had no idea why that it was this, this movement. If they were looking at the guy getting cheated, remember, he was always cheated and victimized in the same way. If they felt similar to him because they were tapping with him, they felt more compassion, even though he's suffering in exactly the same way, objectively speaking. And this is what I found most amazing. 
in the conditions where you felt similar to this guy because you were tapping with him, 50% of the subjects came up to us and said, you know, I, I feel really bad for this guy. Can I go and help him? Less than 20% did when they didn't feel that similarity from tapping. So what this means is very subtle markers here, just tapping your hands in unison can increase compassion by over 30%. It suggests that our morality is very flexible. What it also suggests is a new route to compassion. It's not the case that compassion only comes from the top down. It's not the case that we always have to remind ourselves to be good. What it suggests is that there is a more automatic and effortless route to compassion that can come from the bottom up. Now, there's nothing magical <laughs> about tapping your hands, right? Where I live, what this means in Boston is it means thinking of the new neighbor not as the guy who likes the dreaded Yankees. It means just categorizing him differently, reminding myself that he's not the Yankee fan, he's the guy who likes the local Starbucks as much as I do. There's nothing magic about hand tapping. We've gotten the same results with wearing different color wristbands. All you need is a, similar, is, is a small marker that emphasizes similarity. And what this suggests in some ways is, is an echo of an older idea. Any of you know who, any, who know anything about compassion meditation, what it strives to do is teach people this idea of equanimity, which basically means that friends can become enemies, enemies can become friends, to break down categories. The problem is most of us don't have the time, the hours per day, and the days per year to engage in contemplative practice. And so what I'm suggesting is, let's get there differently by leveraging the mechanisms of the mind. If we can simply have people begin to categorize others based on similarities, then we're getting there without having to devote hours to training the mind through meditation to do it. Now, how do we do this? Well, in our world today, where there's lots of interaction occurring over social media, it's in, it presents intriguing possibilities. So we're working with Facebook, for example, right now to highlight automatically when you report something that's, that's bugging you, a conflict with someone else, can we just present on the screen things that you have in common, likes that you have in common, friends that you have in common, and will that help you to actually resolve conflict automatically by making you feel more empathy and compassion for these people? It's my hope that combining social media and science in this way that we can begin to address individual issues like cyberbullying, but also much larger issues like motivating people uh, to change policies and to act to help the impoverished and the victimized. To do this, we have to realize that compassion and good works don't always come from willpower and guilt. Willpower will fail at times. Rather, what we have to do is subtly alter aspects of the situation to nudge it, to make it effortless. There's lots of ways to do that, and I'm really interested, as we're here, to hear what your ideas might be on how we can do that in your areas of expertise most efficiently. Thank you for your time. <laughs>